目覚めたまえ我が主たちよ気のせいかうん、うん、Regigigas is one of the biggest anomalies in all Pokemon, and it's all because of one reason slow start. An ability exclusive to it, which halves both of Regigigas's offensive stats for the first five turns it is on field. Unlike most abilities which confer some form of benefit to the user, slow start exists solely as a penalty to nerf Regigigas and nothing else. With Regigigas itself getting zero benefits to justify this crippling drawback in terms of game balance. This is a very different situation from other Pokemon designed with penalty abilities, such as Archeops, wishy-washy and slacking. These are regular Pokemon who were designed with drawbacks and conditions to balance out having higher base stats, sometimes on par with that of legendaries. Whereas Regigigas itself is already a legendary with base stats on par with other legendaries, yet is penalized with no real benefit or reason for it. This anomaly has made Regigigas into a subject of much puzzlement and ridicule among fans and players over the years. But what exactly was the reason why the games designers decided to screw over this one Pokemon like this. Because believe me, there is indeed a game design reason behind this, one made with deliberate intent. We can see evidence of that intent within the game Legends Arceus, which is a game with a completely different and changed combat system from the main games, where stats and damage calculations are reworked, turn order functions differently, and abilities are removed. Yet despite this completely overhauled system, the game's designers still went out of their way to rework slow start within this new system, making it the only Pokemon in the game to have an ability apart from Cherim. As anyone with game development or general programming experience knows, making exception cases for system-wide mechanics is not something to be done lightly. So, what do you think might be the game's designer's motivations and reasons for making slow start? Well, let's have a look at the situation from a game's designer's perspective to find out. But before we properly begin, I must first dismiss any idea that this is because of lore reasons, because I will undoubtedly receive comments about it if I don't. We've all heard this song and dance before. According to the Pokedex and the established lore of the universe, Regigigas was a phenomenally powerful ancient Pokemon who had towed continents and forged the other legendary golems, but years of dormancy and being sealed away had caused it to become rusty over time. Poor Regigigas is like an old man whose joints ache every morning when he wakes up, or like a car that was kept in the garage for too long. Slow start is intended to be viewed as a way to represent Regigigas needing time to wake its body up as the battle begins. Now, absolutely none of this actually matters. All of this lore has near zero influence on the game designer's decision to design slow start in this way. Some time ago, I stumbled across a certain video about Regigigas made by someone named Captain Fidget, who asserts that the reason why slow start was designed this way was, and I quote, not simply for the sake of balancing an overpowered Pokemon. Instead, the answer lies in the inspiration for Regigigas and the other titans. Essentially, he claims that the source inspiration behind the myth of the golems is the reason for the game's design decision behind Regigigas' own game design. This claim was, to put bluntly, completely wrong. Because game designers do not give a single damn about lore when it comes to balance. Captain Fidget's video reflected a complete lack of knowledge and understanding regarding game development. Because the game creation process just flat out does not work in the way that his video implies. As I was watching the video, I grew increasingly annoyed as he continuously delved deeper into his lore explanation without mentioning or explaining a single bit about game design in the process. Even his own video's comment section is full of ridiculous balancing proposals, which completely ignore the design intent behind why Slow Start was even conceived to begin with. Also, somehow 186,000 people actually watched this and now got the wrong idea from it. What? <clears throat> 
I must apologize. While I might come across as being a bit rude, I cannot fault Fidget for his video. His own channel's description outright states that he specializes within the background lore of Pokemon games, and his actual research regarding the historical source inspiration behind Regigigas and the Golems was actually quite extensive and interesting. I'd highly recommend watching that video if you'd like to learn more about the history of real life Golems. More crucially, knowledge about the game development process is admittedly not something which most people can reasonably expect to have. Few people have industry experience working in a game company within a development related capacity, and even fewer of those people will want to willingly talk about their experience to complete strangers on YouTube, because they frankly have more important things to do with their limited free time when they aren't exhausted from working or being put on crunch. Fortunately, I have nothing better to do with my free time. Talking to people on YouTube is my hobby. So, before before we begin talking about Regigigas in detail, allow me to tell you a bit about the process behind how game features are proposed and implemented. However, if you would prefer to listen about Regigigas immediately and directly, then feel free to skip to the next timestamp. I will declare upfront that my knowledge is mostly pertaining to matters regarding the development process. The decisions and issues which the higher management, marketing, or production departments deal with are absolutely unknown to me. Fortunately, Regigigas and Slow Start have nothing to do with those departments. Like with every other moderately sized company, a modern non-indie game company is typically divided into different departments and teams, which are tasked with different game projects and specialized into different parts of the production, development, and operation stages. When creating a new character such as a new Pokemon, the initial concepts are typically first agreed upon by the game design, art, and writing teams. These three teams all work out preliminary information about the game's scope and needs, such as the number of characters and Pokemon, the type specialization of gym leaders, Elite Four, and other bosses, basic plot and setting, evolutionary lines, key locations the players will have to explore, and so on. The teams will then discuss with each other and production to come to identify potential difficulties and limitations and settle on an agreeable production scope. The initial pitch for a new character, or in this case, new Pokemon, is typically handled by the writing and or art teams. Together, they create all of the aesthetic elements of that character, such as its visual design, poses, animation, and personality, and draft the story and lore behind that Pokemon's involvement within the game world. Remember, these are all aesthetic elements. These departments hold zero decision-making power in choosing how these characters are actually implemented within the game and play. Meanwhile, the game design team will be busy designing, creating, balancing, and testing gameplay concepts for the game's new features, system mechanics, and general gameplay elements. When they receive preliminary information about the new characters from the art and writing teams, they are then tasked to design the new characters' gameplay concepts, test and confirm the gameplay, identify and document any requests for new mechanics or assets in a design document for the programming team, and and later implement the data for those new features within the game. These are decisions which pertain to the mechanical elements of the game. The decisions which determine how a game plays lies entirely within the hands of the game design team. They are the ones who hold the decision-making power over the overall game balance and determine the way certain game mechanics are to be implemented within the game itself. Let's take Mimikyu as an example. The art or writing team is required to create a totem boss for the ghost trial. So they create the visual design for a cute patchwork mimic Pokemon, an aesthetically matching trial captain, background lore, and animation information, such as how the fake Pikachu head's neck can flop over, as well as instructions for the gameplay needing to showcase that. The game design team will then decide on Mimikyu's gameplay properties, such as its type combination, stats, move pool, and ability. In this case, the artists felt that the neck flop animation was a critical feature about Mimikyu to showcase, and so requested for the game's mechanics to involve it. However, the exact details behind how this is implemented are decided by the game's designers, not by the artists or writers. The launch version of Mimikyu's ability works by preventing the first attack that hits Mimikyu from calling the damage calculation process, playing the animation, and visually changing form in the process. But the game designers could have decided 
it to make the form activate a stat boost or reduce a percentage of damage or activate a low health instead of the current design. Mimikyu's stats and move pool could have even been designed to have made its playstyle more offensive, defensive or supportive. At the end of the day, art and writing have very little involvement over the game design and balance. They only care about the gameplay design matching the aesthetic elements which they have created, such as the animations. The art and writing teams may offer suggestions, but the final call regarding gameplay ultimately lie with the game design team. Granted, this is a very simplified and idealized explanation based on my own personal experience. In reality, at least for the game company I used to work for, it was less about agreeing and asking and more about getting tasks assigned and scheduled to you. And the game creation process was generally more chaotic due to tight deadlines, technical limitations, accidental miscommunication, design related disagreements and changes, and miscellaneous other complications. I must also add that every game company's internal workflow is different, and Game Freak had likely established a more streamlined approach to designing playable characters than my previous workplace did. But even with these limitations, this explanation should suffice to give you, a casual Pokemon fan, some basic insight into the game design process, and help you understand at least that story, lore, and art might exert great influence on a user's game experience, but have relatively little influence over gameplay design and balancing decisions. I must reiterate, rarely are game design decisions ever made because the lore says so. Lore and story do not force game design to match them. Right, detour is over, back to Regigigas. The overall concept for Regigigas was likely conceived by Game Freak's Pokemon design team, which would be mostly artists in this case. However, Slow Start itself was almost certainly created by the game's designers. Artists and writers wouldn't care about how Regigigas' gameplay would be like, and they certainly do not have the authority to dictate it. Regigigas' Slow Start was not made for gameplay balancing, but rather to make Regigigas as a whole serve a unique purpose within the overarching game, a purpose in which Regigigas being terrible for battles is necessary. So to you, my dear viewer, let's have a bit of fun. Tell me, exactly what do you think that purpose is? Remember, don't just think of all Pokemon as units for the player to use in battle or as fantasy creatures to befriend. Many were created to serve as the game role equivalents of obstacles, bosses, and rewards like you would see in other games. Pause the video for a bit and tell me what you think Regigas was supposed to be from a game design standpoint. Try and look at it from the perspective of not just a player, but as the game's creators. So, by now, I'll assume you've got your initial answer. Because this video clip from The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild will show you exactly what Regigigas' game role is intended to be. I'm sure some of you have connected the dots by now. If not, let me explain. Breath of the Wild and its sequel feature approximately 900 plus Koroks hidden all across the game world, who serve as micro-puzzles for observant players as they explore an adventure. Each Korok is an independent and individual puzzle that rewards you with a Korok seed upon completion, and these seeds can then be collected and exchanged for equipment upgrades from Hetsu. However, you only need approximately 400 something out of the 900 Korok seeds for all of the equipment upgrades. After that, Hetsu has nothing to give you. You will gain absolutely nothing of value for finding Koroks beyond that point. However, if you are an absolute mad lad and collect all 900 plus Korok seeds, Hetsu will instead reward you with literal shit. 
Tetsu's Gift is an item that does nothing except sit in your inventory and absolutely does not match the painful amount of effort required to seek out all 900 Koroks. It is an intentionally useless and meaningless reward that exists for the sake of indicating completion and nothing else, which means that players don't feel bad for missing out on it. That is what Vegigigas is, a reward locked behind a side quest and conditions that are so difficult to complete, it needs to be made terrible on purpose so that players don't feel bad for being unable to get it. Recall what was required to obtain Vegigigas within the original Sinnoh games, specifically the prerequisite of needing to capture all three Veggies from Ruby, Sapphire and Emerald. This was asking a child to find an undersea cavern via diving in a region with too much water, realize that these strange dots are a real life language for blind people, read the braille text, solve the puzzle via obtaining two Pokemon, one of which is a rare encounter exclusive to certain dive routes, then locate the three open veggie chambers, solve those three puzzles, and finally capture them. By the modern day, the Braille puzzle is fairly common knowledge. But remember that this was back in 2002, back before we could just casually look up answers on our smartphones. Back then, all we had was Cerebi.net and the official physical game guides. Most people would likely not know what Braille even was, let alone how to solve it. This puzzle serves as an initial yet significant hurdle. The side quest is not just complicated and hard to solve, but is also easy to miss time-consuming to do, and entirely optional. As I mentioned before, the sealed chamber's entrance is located in one dive spot within an entire sea, and Waylord and Relicant aren't exactly the easiest Pokemon to acquire on a casual playthrough. Many casual players could readily complete the entire game without even realizing this side quest even exists. And because it is entirely optional, some of the players who do know it exists might not bother even trying to do it. However, the complexity of the Veggie Trio side quest itself isn't the biggest problem. Convoluted as it was, a player can still solve it with no added purchases required. The main problem, and the reason why Slow Start needs to exist, is actually because of the DS transfer. Regigas exists on the DS, but the Reggie Trio side quest exists on the Game Boy Advance. This means Regigas is potentially the single most pay to win Pokemon to exist in the entire franchise, because it is the only Pokemon that requires you to have both a separate game and a separate console in order to obtain. At least Manaphy had the decency to have its separate game be on the same console. Regigas went a whole step above even that. This is quite different from the modern day trend of having powerful DLC exclusive Pokemon such as Urshifu, Calyrex, Ogrepon, and Terrapagos, who are all extremely overpowered while also being locked behind additional purchases. The difference here is that these are Pokemon which were marketed as one of the biggest highlights of their respective DLC packs, whereas Regigigas wasn't. Part of the reason why some players would spend money on DLC is to get these guys. From a business standpoint, the developers need to ensure that the customer not only gets good value for their money, but also that the customer can actually get what they spent money on in the first place. Regigigas was not only never raised as a selling point in either of the Generation 3 or Generation 4 games, but it was also locked out behind the most complicated quest chain in the franchise to date. In other words, it was locked out by both a paywall and a difficulty wall. Because of all these restrictions in place, Regigigas absolutely needed to be made terrible by sheer necessity. If it was actually good, players would potentially have gotten upset because they would feel cheated out of something amazing that they would otherwise rightfully feel entitled to get. By creating Slow Start, Regigigas was made into a useless trophy prize, something which, just like Hetsu's gift, is a tangible prize 
prize for completing a long and difficult side quest chain, but is so awful in battle that it has near zero gameplay value and players will therefore not feel bad for being unable to obtain it. In practice, the only consequence of not getting Regigigas is just not being able to complete the Sinnoh Pokedex, which is the most completionist goal that exists in Pokemon in general. To really hammer home this point, Regigigas is even captured at level 1 in Platinum, truly sending the message to the player to not even bother trying to use it in battle. So it is certainly true that Slow Start was not originally created for the sake of game balancing reasons. But a game designer doesn't exclusively make decisions for gameplay and meta balance alone. They make decisions that influence everything about how players perceive and interact with a game as a whole, and in this case, Slow Start was created to manipulate the way a player perceives Regigas' value. Of course, this was the reason behind Slow Start's original creation. By the modern day, this no longer applies. In the modern games, Regigas still serves as the final part of a side quest chain involving the other Regis, but every part of this quest chain can now be obtained and completed within the same game, and isn't locked away in another console or generation. So Sword and Shield's Crown Tundra requires a bit of trading to acquire the alternative Reggie you didn't choose, but that's still within relative reason, since Pokedex completion always requires some amount of trading anyway. So in theory, the reason for a slow start's existence is gone, so Regigigas doesn't need to be made terrible on purpose anymore, right? Well, unfortunately, slow start has become an integral part of Regigigas' identity as a Pokemon by this point. The reason why why Legends Arceus went out of its way to recreate Slow Start within its game system is because it's an essential part of what draws people towards Regigas. It's kinda like why characters such as Dan Hibiki in Street Fighter and Tachanka in Rainbow Six Siege are so well loved by fans of their respective franchises. Sometimes, characters come to be loved by players precisely because they are just that terrible. For better or worse, Slow Start makes Regigigas stand out from among the crowd of over 1,000 Pokemon designs. And for a media franchise whose primary goal is to create a hundred globally appealing designs to drive merchandise revenue, Regigigas and Slow Start are ironically kind of a success story compared to numerous more powerful yet otherwise more forgettable Pokemon. It certainly is interesting to see how design choices that made sense for the original context end up becoming confusing legacy decisions when they get retained in future sequels. Perhaps someday in the future, Regigas will finally be allowed to fully get going, but I wouldn't count on it. Well, that closes this video. I hope you've enjoyed it, and have maybe come to look at unusual things in video games from a more game design related perspective instead of a lore based one. Far too many people have the wrong idea about a game designer's job as is. If you've had fun, then leave me a comment. I always enjoy reading interesting discussions and comments via my YouTube studio notifications, and I always make sure to read each and every single one. If you have some more free time, then here's another video. If not, then I shall see you next time.